This is a warning to all of my viewers and subscribers that this conversation that I'm having with Dr. Erica Monhe Greer is of a science fiction nature, science fiction, science future. If you happen to be living in a nursing home or you're feeling a little prudish, you may want to skip this episode. Otherwise, enjoy a nice conversation about personhood deriving from things like artificial intelligence and androids and those other lovely things mentioned in the title. As always, I'd like you to subscribe, like, and share the video if it's of use to you or interesting. Feel free to comment. I'd love to see a discussion on today's topic. That's something that amazes me. I mean, when I first got to know you, um, I didn't have a smartphone, you know, and <laughs> now the, yeah. it's not just the web that's available. It's like the functionality up, of the web, all the stuff you're talking about, you know, Google's alive, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, Google is a, I mean, it's an artificial intelligence that ranks um, authoritative information. So, you know, if we're, yeah, we have to be aware of it, but. Oh yeah, I didn't have a smartphone. I mean, even when my first kid was born, yeah, I don't have any digital pictures of him or his birth because I didn't have a phone camera. You know, yeah, I bought my first digital camera, which was a Canon Elf, I think, just before my daughter was born. And wow. so she has more pictures because she had more digital pictures, but he has a print album, and she. Yeah. It took me years to pull together some print. You got to um, find somebody like in your network who's got a scanner and everything and I get know. your GIFs all <laughs> scanned and, you know, sent out everywhere. I mean, that that was kind of the Wild West, like the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, with the Internet. Well, yeah, and, when I tell my college students that I had when I was in college, I didn't have a cell phone at all. And I had to call my parents on a pay phone at the end of my dorm hall. <laughs> and I've had students be like, what's a pay phone? Like, how does, the, oh. I didn't know the, like, they know what it is kind of conceptually, but they're like, how does that work? Do you put money in it? And I'm like, well, I called collect and had my parents call me back. But yeah, I mean, in theory, you put coins in it and then you get a phone bill. Someone, so. Well, I, I was lucky enough, you know, to um, go to a, an expensive undergrad. And so we got our own phone lines in the dorm. So, I didn't say my undergrad was not expensive <laughs> and it was private. You get what but, you pay for, right? You know? But you get what they give you. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. My dad used to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Technology has increased a ton. Like I, gosh, I mean, I like technology. I love to get the new thing. So like I've been, I'm the first to get a new, the new, version of an iPhone in our family or the new computer or the new iPad. So I usually have the best or top of the line tech in our, in our family. Well, you I'm know, how to... dare anyone else, right? I know no one can impede upon it, but I mean, I'm not an early adopter, so I wait a little bit, but as far as my family's concerned, I upgrade and didn't give my hand-me-downs to my husband and then eventually <laughs> they filter down to the kids. So I just, you know, so hey, as long as you're current, my... I know. Right. So I, and I use it. I love my iPad. I love my iPad with the Apple pencil and I, I don't even carry paper and pen anymore. Wow. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little old fashioned. I still haven't graduated to the calculator because I got the lecture <laughs> in high school, you know, that, you know, yeah. use it for graphing, you get your scientific calculator for graphing functions, but you put it away because you need to like use your hands. You need to memorize this <laughs> stuff, you know, and <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. drilled into me. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a whole transition that I think a lot of this generation doesn't quite appreciate. And why would they, I mean, they're where they started, their starting place is very different than ours, you know, rotary phones, yeah. you know, things like that. And, um, you know, I remember in, uh, in the nineties when, um, uh, you had this low baud dial up, um, you know, and BBSs before the internet sort of was activated in the mid nineties. And then you see web pages, you know, people, myself included like writing, 
HTML and the, the HTML mm-hmm. writing is oh, yeah. like, it's simple. It's, it's like, I could do something that is stupid today. It's like, you know, you yeah. have so many well, when other, is, when is the first, when is the first time you use the internet? When is the first time you used an internet? The internet, yeah, like, like connection. Even, yeah. An internet FTP connection. And um, just any access to the internet. Do you remember your first time? I remember in 93, I was using um, bulletin boards and bulletin boards would send daily Mm -hmm. packets through hubs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they were hooked up to the, um, the, the net or not, or they were their own network. Um, Then I remember playing some things that what's the other, it wasn't the FTP um, packs, but like FTP had its own you know, file transfer before there was a, mm. a, a web right, or yeah, a, remember, yeah. a, a, a browser yeah. that could be used for that. And before Netscape and yeah. AOL and all those things. And so I think the first time I saw it was when I uh, was probably 95. And then in 96, mm-hmm. I got my email address for the first time. Yeah. In okay. Yeah. I think 95 was my first time I used it at a library, a school library. And I'll never forget the librarian saying, we don't have this book, but if you search it here, it'll connect to a thing, the internet, and it will let you know if this book is in any library near us. And I was like, (laughs) and I was, it was, I was so excited during my lunch break to spend my whole lunch break sitting at a little high school library computer listening to the dial up, waiting for it to go, typing in my phrase, waiting for it to connect, disconnect, fail to connect over and over again, just to get to the point where I could like, oh, they have, you know, nobody actually has this book. Okay, well. Like mom, but you know, I I check the next town's (laughs) library from. I know. (laughs) Well, now I go, now I just go to, right? I go to the university that I'm um, affiliated with and I type into the library that I want this and it either gets sent to me electronically like even if the library doesn't hold it within a week or two I can get any electronic any electronic article journal article sent to me or it puts a book on reserve or it requests a book that comes within three to five days from any library within the consortium I mean it's like I just it's incredible yeah, it is. And, um, you know, we have porn to thank for all that because you know, without all the um, um, hornballs in the 90s, you know, driving innovation, <laughs> right? Like the, the World Wide Web excels to the next level because of uh, people trying to, you know, capitalize off of what, you know, otherwise you had a red light district for. And um, here yeah. that's used to produce, you know, um, flash. Well, I don't know if, I mean, they probably made flash, but all these mm-hmm. existing tools are then, um, utilized in new ways, right? Like to, yeah. For entertainment, right? Yeah. To seed some kind of demand or desire and, um, look at us today. Like now we've got a smartphone I'm watching. I can watch a movie like that's clearer than the film print that came out in the eighties mm-hmm. for the same movie. Right. Like, and mm-hmm. it's on my phone and, um, you know, if not, okay, I can take that phone and cast it to a television. And it started somewhere. And there's mm-hmm. this chain reaction that happened. You know, it's kind of like, it's not too different than um, technological innovations for modern appliances that mm-hmm. have their roots in um, the military industrial complex, you know, where, you know, yeah. warfighter innovation is then like, okay, well, there's no war now. So what are we going to do with all this technology? You know, well, you know, let's privatize it or it's reutilized or reimagined now that it's known to exist in the private sector, you know, and it helps us cook, it, you know, helps us drive cars or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, something moves. Yeah. Something well, else. I think, um, I mean, technology, technological advancements have been predicted. And this is my interest in science fiction, because science fiction originally was created by scientists to imagine what will humanity do if this technology is real? Let's create a universe where we imagine we really have, um, you know, cars instead of horses or, you know, things, whatever the next thing is that we don't have yet, that there's a, there's an actual scientific projection for, which now is like, you know, fully functioning sentient robot, you know, house, helpers or whatnot is is, that's increasingly it and sex partners like you know and things that 
that interact with us in like in human like ways and science fiction writes that and and what we found out if you read science fiction back you know for as long as it's been around from uh, many argue from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein which I would agree in the 1800s um, that we find out that humans haven't really changed and humans yeah. don't really change that even when you play out these speculative situations that humans are still selfish they still want to use each other and use technology for their own benefit for their own gain and that those are the temptations that people give into and those are the temptations that your characters and protagonists have to try and overcome and that's so it's not it's not hard to predict i think where where we're going yeah right i mean it's that double edged sword of um you know it's what you make of it right you can take your nuclear power and you know light up the world um or you can you know uh, light up your house <laughs> it's um yeah. what i, I yeah. guess the first light up i meant was like a more destructive you know it can be destructive or creative and um it, it i think technology is just new opportunities for us to ask ourselves what does it mean to be a human and what does it mean to be a, yeah. a person right and so if you have a, a a partner a love partner i mean these um Gosh, the, you know, I, I talked to a friend the other day who didn't know that sex robots were a real thing. And like, yeah, no, people, it's not a doll anymore, right? Like before, you know, like yeah. the joke in college is you have a blow up doll, you know, mm -hmm. and everyone takes yeah. it around, they laugh. And because it's not like, it's not real. And it's for it's, the carpool lane. It's right? for the carpool lane. Exactly. You for put the it carpool in the car. lane. <laughs> that's all that's all it's no it's just for the carpool i swear it's like i don't want <laughs> that's all nothing else hov lane for those of you who don't know what a carpool lane is uh hov <laughs> but yeah you know like what is this thing it's a joke right and um now they start making them more realistic and they're more realistic but they're dolls and okay well what if the doll does this what if it looks at you what if it responds to you what if it, yeah you know and now ai starts activating this form Right. And the form is not a dead form. It's not a um, it's it's inanimate. But now, like, what might we even call that? Because it's not it's um, it's uh, externally animated. Right. Like it, mm -hmm. it's it's animated by something. It else, has um, self animated. It it's has not, like an, an agency outside of you, outside of you. Yeah, totally. And, yeah. you know, these are things mm -hmm. that um, now like people can and they do right like they'll form a relationship with what yeah well and i think we we've seen this too in that film uh her where it's not even a physical thing but there's that the man creates a forms a relationship with his uh version of siri on his phone you know and he forms a relationship romantic interest with this ai that he builds a connection with that basically he has by interacting, you know, when we interact with these voice, um, voice only voice driven AIs, we're actually forming their algorithm, right? Mm, right. And in this film, you know, he's creating her in a sense, and she's feeding his romantic personal and, and um, need for like empathy to where he's he cuts off other human contacts because this is preferable this um being that isn't even tangible that he's created through his interactions and she's responded nothing with nothing but passive compliance mm -hmm. um because that's so much easier right like if we yeah. have a passively compliant partner even if they're not physical that's so much easier than a human relationship um and that's i think for my interests in um in creation ethics and in divine intervention and divine human relationships, I think we put ourselves in the place of a divine being in that way. So like we create something that we project our likeness onto and that algorithm, which is a common, like it's pretty much a household term now, people mostly understand generally what an algorithm is, anyone who's used Facebook, right? Yeah, right. Um, and who's under 60, probably I would qualify in my experience. Um, you know, we're creating our social interaction by manipulating that algorithm or not manipulating that algorithm and allowing it to passively respond to us. So I, you know, I was off Facebook for seven or eight years while I was working on my PhD and raising kids and I didn't really miss it, but I missed social connection. I have a lot of friends that didn't contact me all of a sudden. Um, after I finished my PhD, I went back on Facebook mostly to reconnect with family 
And I found the algorithm to be horribly destructive. I didn't like the political things. I didn't like the advertisements, but now after being on it for a year or so, my whole Facebook feed is um, memes and jokes about grammar and language (laughs) or videos of animals playing together, people rescuing animals, because I've intentionally manipulated the algorithm to bring me what I want. I've created an, an artificial algorithm for what I want to hear, not for what's really, not a representative of what's really out there. That's brilliant. You know, I, I mean, I think about my own Twitter and I made a comment. I don't like Twitter. I, I rarely use it. I'll pop yeah. on once in a while. And um, it's usually to follow a couple people. It. And um, I, I, the comment I made was like, what happened? It's all like, you know, space and nature photos. Now these go- it's turned into Instagram. Like my whole feed is just awesome photography. And I'm like, and then, you know, unconsciously that could have been the algorithm I was producing for myself. Right. Where, um, if I'm liking all these things, like, Ooh, that's pretty. Ooh, Jupiter, you know, <laughs> like, Ooh, galaxies, yeah. Ooh, forest, you know, um, yeah, we're, we're putting, we're trying to, we're trying to fill some kind of, I don't know, we're trying to fill some kind of blank. I mean, I don't know that movie. I've seen Mannequin and uh, uh, Mars yeah, it's and the Real her. Girl. Her? I think it's 2017, 2013. Yeah, I, I, for, I mean, I remember Mannequin in the 80s. That's all I remember. I don't remember the movie. Mm-hmm. I just remember like images from it. And then recently, uh, Lars and the Real Girl. And, you know, like all of these are rooted in, um, you know, Ovid's Pygmalion right? The, the sculptor who fell in love with his own sculpture uh, because of how raunchy uh, women had become on Cyprus. Right. And so like you have exactly what you described that passive response Mm -hmm. that um, (laughs) you don't have to deal with anyone's BS, you know, but then what sort of not BS are you getting in, in return? You're getting your own fantasy. Like you're getting what you think the person would say to you, what you want to hear. Right. If you have this, mm-hmm. it, inter- it's not in a dialogue. Like it's a, what would we call it? I mean, an internal dialogue. Is that right to say, or is it a type of, um, um, I don't know, psychotic monologue? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, where we're having the conversation <laughs> for ourselves and um, projecting it onto an object, right? To to get some kind of positive. Feeling. I think I think a question. There's also a question as to whether that's is that a really a bad thing? I mean, are, are no human relationships as well. We work to bring, you know, consensus. I, I think we strive more consistent than for collaborative comfort, conversation in general. People are like, I, especially today, especially on social media, I want to agree with you. I want you to agree with me. Let's find a consensus on this, or I'll just find someone else to talk to. Or unfriend We're, you, right? <laughs> collaboration is not consensus. I do wonder, though, how it impacts people, especially when it's in some kind of companionship context, right, where um, you're, you're projecting onto um, material that is, you know, called the real girl is one brand. That's a brand name, right? Um, yeah. It's not real in the sense of it being autonomous although like it seems like we're trying to or at least technology is trying to move us in that direction towards some kind of um ai level autonomy but in the meantime like where we are now what does it mean for a young man who or maybe he's not young maybe he's in his 40s well maybe no the 40s is young by the way if you're listening 40s is still young it's not 30 years ago where 40s was old Um, Your body hurts, but you're still young. Um, Outside of that, you know, what does it do for someone who is getting gratified through an object and maybe doesn't have to worry about offending someone or embarrassing himself about, you know, what his desires are. And, you know, maybe those are physical at one point and then they, they move into, you know, some kind of uh, emotional or, or mental like relationality and, um, you know, what does it do for when you encounter real people, you know, on the outside? How do we perceive, you know, relationships, the other? Those are questions I have. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. I think um, I think I mean, I have a big a question and interest in how we define the other from us. And 
evolutionary models, you know, uh, Dawkinsian, you know, kin selection says that evolutionarily for safety reasons and for survival reasons, we prefer people and things that look more like us, which would explain why robots um, who are meant to be safe places, whether it's sexual or psychological or physical or otherwise, um, are made in variety of physical forms that we can select something that looks more like us because that's where trust um, elevates, right? I mean, evolutionary, this is like a scientific evolutionary theory that's been um, like, I guess, proven and, and supported by, by kin selection. So if we, uh, I mean, I, I think we also ought to think about how we engage with our electronic devices that don't mm. look anything like us. And this is a question that an anthropologist um, brought up uh, um, a while ago is, do we treat our computers like this computer sitting in front of me? Do I treat this computer like a, a servant, like a like I'm in a master servant relationship with it? It does my bidding and it is a means to an end for me to accomplish my will, or do I treat it as a collaborative agent in my work, you know, and that may be a small, that may be a very minor and very technical distinction, but, and, and most people I would argue would not explore that distinction. Um, it would take a lot of self-reflection to do that, but I think it is an important one to say, how do I, how do I interact with the devices around me? Yeah. Are they my servants? Are they my master? Do they control what I do? And that's a question that's being had in parenting circles about phones and oh, yeah. other electronic devices, you know, are they mastering me? Um, but I think there is a kind of, I think there's like a, a useful concept there to say, okay, this computer looks nothing like me. It doesn't have a face. It's, it's a square, it's flat. It, it, it's a screen and I interact with it personally. I put personal notes and things and diary and right. whatever else on it. And I interact with it exploring that seemed to my attention a couple of years ago, just how do I think about my computer as a working partner? And I think it, it doesn't, it's not that it affects the computer. It's not that the computer has feelings yeah. that I need to be aware of. Right. And that's how we're taught when we're young, don't hurt other people's feelings. Right. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. It's not that I'm trying to preserve the feelings of my computer. It's that I'm trying to make sure that I'm being a person of integrity and that I'm being a person who practices having, uh, giving dignity to, the things that I interact with. And, and because those things may be 90% of my time, a computer for a lot of us, that is, um, but 10% of my time at the very least, and hopefully more um, is interacting with human beings that deserve mm. dignity, you know? And I, and I think that, I guess that's what I've been thinking about too. Like, what is the other, I, if we, once we engage with something, it is an other, but it becomes a part of us and what we practice with that thing shapes who we are and the kind of people we are, you know? And I believe, I believe that humans have an ethical responsibility to become better individually and corporately. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm a kind of a humanist in that way. Well, I wonder if any studies have been done on, you know, slavery and, um, like, do we, were slaves ever, you know, was there a preference of slave types, you know, whether it's um, physiognomy, you know, uh, their features, their, um, you know, uh, what they look like, what they sound like, um, you know, was there a preference for indentured servitude, you know, or, or people from different regions, um, you know, and I think of robots, for example, like, what's the... Robots in factories, they look nothing like us. They're mm -hmm. serving a purely, you know, functional purpose. But as, you know, we bring something into the home or we want a toy to play with, it's usually humanoid in having two mm -hmm. legs, two arms, some kind of torso and head, right? Like, and little by little, do we prefer that type to, you know, the data Android, you know? um type mm -hmm. you know like do we want someone that is a another surrogate human or some kind of um I don't, well i mean they're androids but some sort of you know not just a, a humanoid but like a, a human companion and then do we yeah. want a rule or master over it i don't know I'm, um there's a lot of overlap with slavery i guess yeah, I think so. And I think um I'm sure there are studies done because I've heard about military uh, yeah. psychological methods, right? Using othering the enemy so that it's easier to attack 
um, and shoot your target. I know that's a sci-fi story. I think Philip K. Dick has written a story about that and some other uh, 20th century science fiction writers have also dealt with some extreme like hyperbolize that situation but I mean look at I mean you know I, what you can't have a conversation about bringing in Nazis at some point but like you know that was the that was a social psychological method of the of the SS for the Nazis was to other yeah um, the enemy that they wanted to exterminate to first make them pure unhuman to uh, the SS military so that um, these kids would grow up believing that these were not even human. They were so different from them. And it, with robots, I think we're doing the opposite, right? We're saying mm. um, they're not other. Um, we're saying they're more and more and more and more like us. And I I do keep up um, with the, I read a blog or e-magazine called Futurism or Futurist. And uh, they release a lot of articles about the progress of sex bots and I have a friend um, who I interviewed on my podcast that I think you referred to, Jeremy Meeks, who's writing a PhD on the ethics of theological ethics of sex bots, looking back at um, Augustine and saying, hey, can we apply any of this kind of procreation theology to, um, to sex bots? And if we can, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and how should we talk about it? And I think uh, from what I've seen, the technology, while it's not approved in the United States is, is very real, um, especially in Eastern Asian countries. A lot of this is being developed um, very real and very responsive, very highly adept and highly uh, socialized and responsive um, robots that can be used for physical companionship. So, I mean, yeah. the question is, you know, one, are we going to, are we going to allow this if we aren't, it's still going to come in on black market chains, you know, and what are we going to teach our kids about that? I think as a parent, I can't get away from that concept. No, that, I think that's the key is um, the people who will, the today's youth and even their children, the people who experience the new standard of norm, right? Where those things are around and everyone has them, you know, like even in the old days, like um, finding a certain type of magazine was, mm -hmm. you know, like treasure hunting for for mm -hmm. young boys you know in the neighborhood right like yeah. <laughs> whether some someone's older brother purchased it or they found their dad's stash you yeah. know or my dad didn't have one dad you're off the hook you i know you're on these podcasts so, so um there's <laughs> always other people but like now you just type it in and the norm is so radically different and i you know it's a different conversation you have to have with the youth and so once you know we make these into um these into objects that are present among us. I mean, what do you do if someone goes over to someone else's house, you know, uh, uncle Billy's house or uncle Freddie mm -hmm. and in his closet, you know, is this thing and it turns on, you know, it's not just yeah. a thing that's there, but like you hit the wrong button and all of a sudden there's a conversation happening or, you know, yeah. uh, maybe it, it's moving. And um, that's its own conversation. Like, you know, we, we have to have some kind of conversation with the people who are going to grow up with this because I think just like the web at a certain point, what this is motivating, you know, some kind of human um, androids are starting through mm -hmm. sex bots is my thesis, right? Like you get to mm -hmm. creating these, these objects and because now they're still objects, they're still mechanical um, advanced adult toys. Mm -hmm. If you can think of it that way, but as they learn to respond mm -hmm. to you, um, if they can read your facial expression or, you know, they're, um, they're equipped to interact with language, you know, yeah. there's always going to be the question of at what level is their understanding versus, you know, um, ability to respond. Right. And that's, I mean, that's a question yeah. for AI developers and things today. Um, yeah. How does the algorithm develop and to what is it developing? And sooner or later, those things, maybe they're going to, act in a different type of service right and maybe yeah. they're going to clean maybe they're going to um, cook maybe they're going to whatever and then all of a sudden you know we have a new class of humanoid to compete with the human i mean this is terminator stuff right yeah. <laughs> but yeah and I'll, i mean also i you know i've watched a lot of star trek and i the thing that has always fascinated me the most is the quest for humanity by the non-human characters like um 
data in Star Trek Next Generation and in yeah. uh, Star Trek Voyager, you have the emergency medical hologram who yeah, right. actually yeah. finds out that his model was discontinued because it was a low operating level. And um, over time, he finds out that all of his model were put to work working in mines. And he writes a book to create this kind of revolution and to show them that they can resist and they can they have personhood and they have viability outside of their um, they're basically treated like slave labor because they are they are seen. Um, I mean, speaking of how something looks affecting its otherness, you know, they are all identical beings. And so they yeah. don't look like humans that are unique, even if you had a set of twins, right? They dress different or, or show themselves different. But, you know, these are just created, you know, a, sim a symbol of their createdness is that they all look, they're manufactured, right? So yeah, right. Um, I think it's really interesting that idea. I I don't know if you are familiar with the recent little um, short series of shorts. I think it was like 10 minute episodes that Anna Kendrick um, starred in and produced called Dummy, where she finds her boyfriend's sex doll and steals it and uses it as a writing partner. And she talks, the sex doll talks to her <laughs> and it's her own mind and creates a kind of feminist movement saying like, you know, I don't deserve this. I deserve to be treated better. And it's a really interesting uh, take. It's a, it's a, it's just a blow up sex doll, but it's an interesting take on a sex doll that takes on a personality in order to say, Hey, I have value and dignity yeah, right. beyond what I was created for. And that should be recognized. And it's a really, it's a comedy, you know, and it's made to be funny, but it is, it makes this kind of inter interesting point, you know, where it's like, um, there's a sisterhood in this that's kind of formed it's just a really interesting i just i just think it's a really interesting and unique take on some of this like what are we going to do when we have sex dolls like are we going to liberate them yeah um and i think there will be, be people who do and i think the question comes back to the question that um uh the west world series asks often which is um the the quote that they use which is from shakespeare you know these violent uh means have violent ends and it's the way that we treat another mm. thing it's not whether or not it has memory of the way we treat it it's not whether or not it gives us consent but it's whether we respect consent boundaries you know and that shapes who we are our actions more than it shapes um the thing that we're unconsenting to if that makes sense, or the thing that is or is not giving consent. And I think because of, for a lot of different reasons, you know, when we have a trial case, let's say of unconsensual, non-consensual sex in, in America anyway, you know, the trial centers around whether the, the, not the perpetrator, but whether the recipient actually gave consent or not. Right. But it would be interesting if we flipped the model and said, and put the focus on the perpetrator and said, did you actually consider consent and take it seriously before you acted. And then we put the pressure on the other side. And I think that might be an interesting distinction that we might want to think about before we're introduced to this whole sex spot world where we have robots, which um, at this point cannot give or take or remove consent. But if we put the burden of consent on the perpetrator and on the, on the recipient of a sexual act, then then I think we place the focus where it belongs, which is on the person doing the action, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there's a precipice moment too, right? Whether it's with the um, the uh, medical hologram, you know, who, by mm -hmm. the way, you, you know, Voyager teaches us that, um, you know, the future upgraded model happens to be Andy Dick. And that's, uh, <laughs> is that always, you know, is that what we're looking forward to in the future? Um <laughs> But, you know, him or, or Commander Data, um, you know, and, and those, the early, look, Next Generation is a fantastic series. And so mm -hmm. the questions surrounding personhood and data, yeah. um, like, are so relevant to this conversation because there's oh, a, yeah. there is a tipping point, you know, where, you know, what is your, what is what qualifies you as a machine? And whatever that is, how does that differ from, you know, the humans who are putting the laws and the rules together? Because at one, if you are a machine and your um, appearance of consciousness is but an appearance and not um, autonomous, 
or autocephalous, if I can say that, um, you know, are you anything other than machine? Because it's, you know, that's the question that, I mean, we, we infer our personhood, right? You know, being humans. Yeah. And yeah. is there ever um, a place for extending that? Like, and there's got to be some tipping point. There's got to be some line to be crossed where, you know, the machine is no longer only a machine because we can look at the, you know, we can look at biomechanics of, of animals, in, including humans, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a, yeah. a mechanical process through which we operate. Um, our way of developing has its own biomechanical process. It's through conception. Yeah. You know, so what does it mean then to, you know, what does it mean to conceive of, um, you know, an advanced bot, you know, when does that, ha when does that tipping point happen? And I think I don't have an answer for it. I mean, it's the, I think that's the question driving, you know, innovation, yeah. but science fiction, especially, and that's where science fiction well, is think, useful, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I read an article on the history of AI and um, out, came out of Harvard and they were saying that I think the, the guy who originally presented a paper on artificial intelligence and presented that idea was somewhere around 1950. And that was the question he asked. He said, humans, um, the processing, the way that humans process consciousness and decision-making is no, is really no different from these computers. It's just more advanced. And so is there a way that we can Bill work toward um, artificial intelligence that mimics or even exceeds human capabilities. And I think that's, I mean, that's where the quest seems to have begun. Um, I think that is an interesting, uh, as an interesting aspect of how we define, how we define personhood, but it's not the, it's not the only extent of it, because I think as we know, like personhood has been given and taken even from other human beings in the yeah, past exactly. how we ended up with right. like slavery in the antebellum south right by defining um, people from certain regions and certain um, physical attributes as not human or as lesser than human and so um, I think that distinction I think it's good to make that distinction I love that Star Trek Next Generation episode I can't think of the name of it where they fight they have a legal court trying to decide if if commander data has personhood status or not before scientists want to open him up to try and replicate his processor so they can have other advanced yeah. robotic commanders. It's an early episode. It's in like season one or two. I yeah. Think. yeah. Yeah. It's pretty early on. I think it's a really interesting. Uh, it's a really interesting case, not least of all because of the way their legal system is. They make someone from within their, their own circles. One of data's friends has to act as a prosecutor against him. And I think that, um, you know, it's even more helpful when you're having to like, look at something from a side you don't agree on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Whenever we speak of data's yeah. brain, we speak of his neural network, right? Or I mean, mm -hmm. maybe I'm remembering it yeah. wrong, but it's the same sort of, yeah. you know, look behind, I've got my own neural networks, you know, my nod to it behind mm -hmm. me. Um, but it's a, it, it, what's a brain, right? And when it comes to mechanics or, you know, um, developing intelligence, we'll, maybe we'll use the name neural network, but it's still, you know, the, the premise is rooted in the brain, neurons, you know, that um, compose this conversation that this organ has, or, you know, the interaction of, um, you know, the different parts or pieces of this organ and how you know, it has its own developing algorithm. You could call it that through um, mm -hmm. synaptic pruning, for example, right? Where, you know, certain things are learned reinforced, you know, everything is learned, acquired, it grows, and it creates interconnectedness that either is strengthened or weakened over time based on rhythm. And that's mm -hmm. very much like the algorithm. If you're liking, you know, um, planetary imagery mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. and you're liking, you know, beautiful natural landscapes all the time, those synaptic pathways of the algorithm, so to speak, you know, they build and develop, and the others weaken, um, you hear less of the uh, political crap, or at least in my case, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not a fan of that. I'm a fan of space and planets and planetoids mm -hmm. and, but, you know, like, um, planets like Pluto, I mean, not planetoids. Mm -hmm. Pluto is king of the planetoids, thus a planet. Don't go there. You can, you can otherize the gas giants if you want to do that. Right. Gas giants are mm -hmm. other, so they're not a real planet. They're gas giant. You know, maybe that's the next step. Sorry. It's a little dig at Neil deGrasse Tyson there. <laughs> Um, oh, no. but you know, I mean, it's the same conversation. You're othering something, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. 
you know, the, the neural network being like how that moves and how that, you know, um, develops, like, is it the point that the things we've created start to develop their own neural networks, their own hardware? Cause that's ultimately what's happening in, in the human, you know, like yeah. our hardware is moving and developing and we have a way of consuming new matter and disposing of excess matter or irrelevant matter. And that matter that we acquire is used to rebuild the hardware that's, you know, that composes us. Right. So I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm somewhere along there and well, I think well, data is a helpful. Um, I yeah. I mean, the thing about data that they keep isolating in the show as unique to any other robotic development is um, his positronic brain, right? That he can do what you're talking about, the neural networks, he can build neural networks. Um, and I think a question that comes up there that also comes up in a lot of other science fiction that I've, that I've consumed is, are we more than the sum of our memories? You know, mm -hmm. um, data, it's a recurring theme of what data, what is unique about data and his memories. And at one point his memories are wiped and he kind of takes on a different persona until they're restored. And, um, and we do, we act, right? If I had a sliding doors moment in my life when I was younger, you know, say like, especially like in childhood, if you went two different directions, you know, something, uh, you know, something happened to your parents or didn't happen to your parents or you, um, you know, did move, make a big traumatic move or didn't make a big traumatic move, you know, those create memories. And we actually, you know, right. Psychologists will talk about, about this in therapeutic ways. I think I'm not an expert in that, but like, you know, our memories and what we've been through shape how we make decisions, how we build yeah. boundaries with people. And so um, I think one of those things comes up a lot in artificial intelligence. If we implant memories, um, for instance, this comes up in science fiction explorations where it can, can I live forever if we have a productive, like if we have a robot that's advanced enough, if I can take all my consciousness and put it in that robot, then can I never die, right? And that's a question that, a trope that comes up a lot. So the question is, what is in that consciousness? Is it, is it just my memories, like all captured together and put in? Then if I move all of my memories from my life experience into this other body, will that body continue on my life in the same trajectory as I, I would go if I could live, if I could keep living forever? Or is there something else to it? And I think that's a question that is raised a lot, you know, how, what is the relationship of our life experience, our memories, and those neural networks that build synapses as we go and as we learn? And what happens to the human person, let's say after an accident, right? Like someone who's right. undergone uh, some type of damage. Um, to the brain. I, I mean, we don't know enough about, um, I mean, we can tell when certain parts of the brain, I'll, I'll say die, but when they become inactive or mm -hmm. um, ineffectual and, um, you know, that, ha that manifests maybe in terms of personality, right? Like that's the mm -hmm. easy, yeah. that's the low hanging fruit, right? The, you know, yeah. the Phineas gauge, you know, bit. Yeah. Um, but what about like, you know, the, the personhood of someone who is, um, taken on a new state, you know, and, um, shows little to no sign of, you know, their, their previous, um, understanding of the world, right. So, sometimes you just don't know what's going on there. I have a, a friend actually who, um, you know, he's passed on now, but he, uh, went through, a. um, a, a process where he went comatose for a while and finally like he made progress enough to communicate and they gave him a computer and he typed in like f-u-c-k like that's just that was his response mm -hmm. to you know what the last you know 18 months had been for him and what do you say at that point like if you can't communicate mm -hmm. you're now impaired tool wise um you know, and, and what does that mean for who and what you are? And, and um, he went through several uh, encouraging periods and discouraging periods, you know, ups and downs. And uh, at some points, like it, certain conversations we could have because whatever it was triggering was still active, you mm -hmm. know, um, and other conversations were, you know, you're just sort of waiting. You didn't know whether he got it or not. You didn't know whether 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it was processing and it was still him, but it was almost a new him. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, where so do capability, we ability capability and behavior and physical aspects become part of the person? Yeah. If, let's say for example, that the, that somehow, um, what we would call consciousness can be activated with a memory transfer, you know, because the other way to think of consciousness is just a brain state, you know, yeah. it's not a, an, an external thing, but, you know, a, a, just a, a way the brain is at certain points, you know, when it's not being cleaned out, um, you know, and, and cells being, you know, recycled, you know, consciousness, you know, or we've activated what we would yeah, call yeah. consciousness to memories um, in an external structure, right? Instead of the human body as structure, maybe it's something else as structure. What if that's something else we can make 20 feet tall and um, get as many arms as necessary? Or maybe like I have, a, um, you know, a different tool instead of an arm, like maybe mm-hmm. I have a, um, you know, I have lasers that allow me to activate yeah. things at distance. Does that change the, you know, what's happening to whatever the neural network is and redefine my person or is it the same person? Um, yeah, I mean, those are interesting questions. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I know there's a whole genre of uh, literature is called cyberpunk that does that where you can have like an eye replaced with a yeah, telescopic yeah, eye. Yeah, or, yeah. I'm not, I haven't, I haven't read a lot of that, but um, I mean, to bring it more to, to um, you know, more subtle differences, but, or like what you're talking about with your friend, maybe even more subtle than that, like, Uh, think of technologies like LASIK, you know, as someone who wears glasses, uh, uh, you know, as someone who wears glasses, I know that sometimes like I wore contacts for a while and having glasses or not having glasses sometimes changes the way that I perceive things around me and the way that I feel people perceive me. Hmm. And I think it's the same. I think it's, I think it can be anything. I think it can be the color of your hair or the, you know, um, I don't know, even down to the clothing that people wear, you know, and I think, uh, I think we, we do make a lot of judgments based on physical from external sources. Like we base a, a lot of judgments on that, but also like, you know, I think internally, you know, sometimes like if I'm wearing, you know, sweats and a t-shirt, I feel like I can't be as productive, you know, I'll put on like some more formal clothing if I'm going to try and like do something. Cause I need to feel like a more formal person, you know, if I'm going to go make a presentation or even when I'm at home which is a discussion, I guess, that's been had a lot um, over the last couple of years with 2020 and everybody being locked down and doing Zoom interviews, uh, Zoom meetings versus uh, person to person, you know, how does that affect us? And I read a great article about how, you know, seeing um, a single person really affects the way we communicate differently than when we're sitting in a room and we can see different things happening in our periphery. Yeah. Um, the way that we react, the way we respond, the way that we speak and present ourselves even changes when we're in a room full of six people or 20 people versus when we're just in a space where there may be 20 or even 30 people, but we're only just seeing our own, our own reflection and one or two at a time, you know, on a screen. And we're seeing very flat two-dimensional Uh, versions of them that the you know that it's a more more an intense engagement um you know i think all those things i mean technology definitely impacts the way that we interact with the world around us yeah i'm a real i mean what is the (laughs) what is the point i guess is you know like you know what can we do with that information we have a lot of data on it but what do we do with it you know do we how do we you know what is our goal for tomorrow to make a better tomorrow, you know? Yeah. That's kind of what I was going to ask. It's like, you know, what do we, where do we <laughs> well, go? I asked it first. And you did. You, but, yes. And it's where do we go from here. like, it's kind of my sort of running theme, you know, lately and even preceded, um, you know, the whole, you know, lockdown mode. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's what kind of world do you want to live in is the, the question. What, and what's your role in that? right? Like, Mm -hmm. how are you going to, it's, I think it's a different way of asking a lot of the same questions we Mm -hmm. grow up with. Um, But, you know, like, we should be actively constructing that world. And, you know, with, you know, all sorts of technologies, whether it's, you know, nuclear power, gene therapy, you know, whatever, um, is it going to be used for good or for evil, you know, and 
that's the that's the question but, i well, mean i don't know if those are, are i don't know if those are the only two choices though i don't think everything we do or create like falls into a category of um good or evil and i don't that's not what you're saying but um yeah maybe it's not a choice of using something for good or evil but maybe there's some ambiguity and complexity with what we I mean, what our capabilities are and what are the limits of our capabilities. But I, I think a lot of people, when I have this discussion with people, um, they, they go back to their answer kind of depends on how they were raised. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, religiously, religious, culturally, I would say not necessarily like a theological thing, but like a cultural religious perspective. I mean, for example, you know, people who think that the world is going to end and we're never going to become better. Yeah. Um, have a different perspective of the future and technology. And it's very apocalyptic and very um, dark. Whereas people who believe in the capabilities of humans and the betterment of society see a future that is made brighter by technology. And, and that's not everybody. Everybody doesn't fall in those two camps, but I've, I've realized that um, people are heavily shaped by their, by essential beliefs that they may, may, they may or may not even take seriously. I'm not talking about religious people. I'm talking about agnostics and atheists and sure. people who are, um, more or less a religious, even, you know, some of my college students and others, but, um, but they're without knowing it subconsciously, their beliefs about the future have been shaped by what they've been taught about the future. Um, I or think it's really they've important for us to people. parse that out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, are, are so, people something you like <laughs> or people, something yeah, right. you, you know, right. like want to avoid at all costs. Right. right. And, um, and maybe the reasons are because, well, because they're people and we know what they're capable of, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the question, you know, we have for, you know, for being human, I guess. And um, I don't know, we, we start with Pinocchio and um, here we yeah. are with all these naughty bots and um, who are serving us and, and things like that. And, um, <laughs> well, and I mean, I think we, I, I think these, these are important questions to ask now when we have other ethical questions on the horizon, um, at least in the United States that involve um, sexual activity inside and outside procreation. Yeah. And this is where like my friend is doing this work on sex bots and he's taking it back to St. Augustine, who I personally just like hate because of his like in involvement in causing this like massive um, restrictive purity culture in America that um, I don't know affected affects a lot of women and and affected a lot of young girls especially in the 80s and 90s when I grew up and I think in really negative and restrictive and ways that that were not very honest either and you know I think sex spots should be part of that conversation you know are we are we okay with sex outside of a procreation model? And if so, like what are other things? Cause we have other technologies that aren't sex spots that encourage sex outside of a, a procreation model and even outside of marriage. And that's, you know, birth control, right? That's a yeah. technology that yeah. used to not be available, you know, for everybody. And so, you know, once we, once now that we've opened that door is that a slippery slope model to say, now everything is permitted, you know, as you know, I, where is the door? Is the door consent? Is the door human? Is the door, you know, um, uh, abilities of reaction, you know, is it okay to have, you know, a sex toy, but not a sex bot, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a lines that have to be drawn. And if we don't draw the lines, then, then we're going to end up with a hyperbolic society that says, no, we can't even talk about anything. We can't discuss anything. We're locking everything down or, or yes, everything's permissible, you know? And I think that that's why we need to find a way of talking about it. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, whether the, the, the thing is, like you said earlier, you know, um, more like us in appearance, right? Like, are we, um, you know, you know, a toy or whatever sort of device may not be in the same image and likeness, right? It may be some kind of contraption, mm -hmm. right? But then as we move into these things that look more and more like us, it seems to me, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but that we're trying to um, maybe fill in some kind of hole or try and complete um, some sort of aspect of maybe ourselves, in the process yeah, of I mean, making I, it. I think that's what all 
relationships are trying to do from a very mm. naive and not studied psychological perspective. Yeah, I mean, sure. I think we seek relationships with other people and intimacy to try and fill that gap. And the thing that, um, as I brought up earlier, with, like that was demonstrated in that movie, Her, and I think has kind of been like played on in a lot of different sitcoms and, and stuff is falling in love with the, the Siri from your phone, you know, this unbodied, you know, detached person that becomes who you want it to become the more you interact with it. And um, I mean, how easy is that? It's so much easier than, and you brought this up too, you know, it's so much easier than trying to go out on a limb and put yourself out and risk yourself in a relationship and asking for intimacy from someone who may not want that. And then you have to suffer through rejection and, you know, those feelings of inadequacy and all the things that that brings, you know, and I think it is hard. And I think, um, you know, anyone who's been married or in a long-term monogamous relationship knows it's, you know, it's hard. And there are things, there are things you grow together in and there's things you'll never connect on because yeah. you're just different people seeking different things. Um, but I mean, as I guess I, I, I see that as a good thing, like not a bad thing. I think it's good to continue to strive for those things, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, it can be exhausting and I could see why people would want to avoid that. We're going, we're heading in a direction, you know, with the development of bots and um, not just bots, but bots to droids to eventually we're going to end up with Cylons, right? Like there's going to be some kind of Cylon type, maybe, um, yeah, you know, future. And I mean, they sort I think of hint more at like, it. I think more like humans. I mean, the Cylons have like this magical evolutionary interference, which I'm still trying to work out from the lore. They never fully developed it because they didn't. From the um, toaster, Caprica. starting as the yeah, toasters. Ca- uh, Caprica. Did you ever see Caprica? It was a very short run prequel. Well, no, if you haven't seen Battlestar Galactica, it's a very short oh, pre- no, prequel. Oh, no, I saw it advertised. Series. Yeah, yeah, but it, I think they started, tried to go down that road um, to fill in the gaps of a story that um, is very briefly and very vaguely told toward the end of Battlestar Galactica by one of the final five Cylon. And so... Um, I think what we more likely will end up with is something like in humans, uh, that television series, the British one, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, or also if we, if we do make that leap into the evolution of AI, we have something like Bicentennial Man, which Robin Williams starred in, okay. uh, which was a movie from the nineties. I, re- I think. Yeah. I remember was... the title. I don't think I've seen it, which is. Yeah. Not... I, I didn't, I hadn't, I don't think I had either. And a couple of years ago, I, bought the dvd and watched it but i think it's actually streaming right now but it is really interesting because is the evolution of a robot um who's first just kind of a house servant that gets upgraded as time goes by until he's his until his personhood is defended yeah at the end so i think you have i think that is a picture of a more realistic ai robot future but definitely starting as house house cleaners then you also have like labor issues and other things yeah yeah we're, we're back into you yeah. know slavery at some point and you i know. know what do yeah. we want what kind of world do you want to live i in? know yeah well and how do we give dignity to a, yeah. a, to you know whatever a creation like that and should we and do we and have to do we have to speaking of sentient artificial intelligence in science fiction series in battlestar galactica uh, the artificial intelligence creation that human created evolved on their own. And there's a whole external story for how and why they evolved. But they evolved to eventually um, look I- identical and not even different in their behavior, in the appearance of their skin, in the, in the way that they wear clothes, in the way that they um, speak. They are indistinguishable from humans. The big difference is that they have uh, mental capabilities that actually exceed human yeah. capabilities in that they can uh, they can engage with each other, with others of their kind through some kind of like um, neural transmission. So they can kind of like speak without speaking to others of their kind. And also that they have a kind of a reincarnation, a built-in science driven reincarnation system where if you die, your consciousness is automatically uploaded into a new body that's identical to your previous body. Um, meaning that there are actually also several of each kind, right? So there's 12 models, there's many of each of the of the models, and they are identical, 
but one of the things that we see in Battlestar Galactica is um, is that a couple unique personalities emerge and they emerge because of the particular Cylons, um, the, of a particular Cylons interaction with the human species. So because for example, um, I don't know if this is gonna be big, big spoilers for the show. <laughs> so you exactly. have to put a warning on it. <laughs> well, we'll see. For we'll, example. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, Okay. that's a big spoiler. So, uh, the Cylon who is on the ship acting as a human, um, she's uh, a, like a planted agent. So she doesn't even know herself that she's a Cylon. But once you find out she's a Cylon later in the show, we see her journey when she re we see her reincarnation and she even still knowing that she's Cylon having, you know, um, proof, having physically experienced the Cylon rebirth, knowing that she's a Cylon, she still chooses to live as a human um, when she's back um, in the company of other Cylons and she separates herself out. Over time, she becomes a kind of a leader and inspiration for other of the, of the AI, of the Cylon, because she has formed her own kind of unique approach and appearance um, and way of looking at the world, but that all has come because she had a loving romantic relationship with a human and she was part of a loving kind of a, a bonded family on the ship, which is yeah. a big theme in Battlestar Galactica is like, is like creating family ties in your, you know, in the work environment. So, um, and it's not just her, it's also the six that um, interacts with Gaius before he, before the event that takes them all into space. Um, she, when she comes back, she has her own name again, Caprica six, rather than just a, a generic six. And she has her own personality and it's largely shaped by her interactions with humans. And she has a larger like capacity for sympathy for the humans than the other Cylons. So it's interesting. I think one thing that is interesting about that and talking about the other is um, the Cylons are just as discriminant discriminating against the humans as the humans are against the Cylons. And mm -hmm. they have a range of personalities that would match any range, any human range of personalities, which is one of the things that makes the tension uh, very complex on the show. But um, one of the things is that uh, comes out of that is that once you experience a relationship with someone who is other, even if you didn't know they were other at the time of your relationship, afterward, you have a greater sympathy for the other. And I think that's, I think that mirrors real life, right? I mean, even if we don't look at robots, if we look across, you know, ethnic boundaries or cultural boundaries, you know, or even um, religion or education or any of the, any of the things that separate us into smaller groups of humanity, once you cross that bridge and you have a relationship with someone who is an other, you see, oh, we're more alike than different. And that's what happens in Battlestar Galactica yeah. is the, not only do they look exactly alike, even though they're very, very different species in the way that they process information, the way they communicate and even their goals and objectives. But once one experiences the other um, in a societal or in a communicative relationship, uh, whatever that is, whether it's romantic or familial or whatever, um, then there's kind of a turning point in the way that they have sympathy and you begin to have these questions of, are they actually so different? You know, why are we fighting this war? Um, and I think that's, that's a significant thing. Although it's not all about war, I think we can bring it back into the conversation about sex as well. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the war is kind of the pivot to get the show started, right? Mm -hmm. To put the characters in yeah. the situations for that. Um, you know, well, you've done, I mean, you're the person to talk to if anyone wants to talk to about Battlestar Galactica. Um, tell us what you've been doing. Apparently, <laughs> apparently. Um, so I was uh, actually thinking through this recently when I wrote the preface to my book. Um, while I was working on my dissertation, my outlet was watching science fiction shows over and over again because I like um, familiarity. And I was on my probably my third time through the Battlestar Galactica, uh, the reimagined series in 2004, when I realized I had so many interesting questions about uh, identity and religious um, ethics that were coming up every time I watched a lot of the science fiction that I watched, but particularly this show, because it talks a lot about gods and prayer and um, mission. And 
so I started just kind of writing down some notes like, oh, here's some questions yeah. I have, here's some thoughts I have about artificial intelligence. So um, what that turned into is when I finished my dissertation, I um, actually kind of accidentally was talking about this with an editor I didn't know was an editor who introduced me to another editor. And I ended up getting a book contract to write about religious themes in Battlestar Galactica. So I, um, I turned my hobby into a job, which is uh, never a good idea. I don't recommend it to anyone. It's, it makes everything very, very um, much less fun um, because it's always better. I always say I love to have written um, and I don't necessarily love writing, um, but I also tell all my writers to write drunk and edit sober. So there's a little <laughs> balance in that. Um, but yeah, so I wrote a book called Religion in Battlestar Galactica and it's called, uh, the main title is So Say We All, which is so say uh, we all. kind of so say we all, which is the prayer, the amen and battle. It's amen. For the humans. It's, a- it's <laughs> amen. It's equivalent. Amen. Yeah. Equivalency. Um, and so uh, now that is going through publishing and it's almost done. I just received the typeset copy. So it is uh, due to be published in autumn of 2022. That's going to be awesome. Um, you know, we'll have you back on when, it, you know, maybe in the fall when it comes out and the um, yeah. You know, talk more right. Battlestar Galactica specific. So um, anything yeah. further you want to plug before we, you know, take off? Well, I, if you're interested in science fiction or even discussing or talking about it, I would love for people to come and engage on my website, which is uh, scholarlywonderless.com. And hopefully you can type that into the description so people could find it. Uh, I, I write about a lot of different things, um, everything from biblical ethics and biblical theology and language stuff, which is my um, academic specialization. Uh, but I also do a lot of reviews of science fiction, most recently Octavia Butler, and um, I'm reading some Adrian Tchaikovsky um, and uh, Asimov right now. So okay. I kind of engage with a lot of different topics on religion and science fiction in different ways so that's awesome please come there yeah check it out everybody um yeah well well, thanks for stopping by i enjoyed the conversation i think we could probably talk longer but it would get um more hyper nuanced yeah (laughs) that you know you need more niched (laughs) thank you again and i look forward to checking the book out and um yeah thank you see you later okay bye mike Thank you.